Oh, well, thank you everybody for coming today. Welcome to our program. How are you really? I think uh, we could spend probably a few days on this. Um, we're gonna talk about mental health and substance abuse in the post pandemic world. So thanks for coming. You're actually gonna get competence credit for this. So that's nice. You'll have one hour of competence. Your CLEs uh, certificates will be in your inbox 24 to 48 hours from now. Um, my name is Deary Mom. I'm a senior associate at Lawrence H. Jacobson APC. We practice business and real estate law, and I'm also first vice president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Um, I'm really excited about our program today. I wanted to get a little bit of announcements out of the way first. Um, first of all, this program is presented by the barristers. If you are a law student awaiting bar results or in practice eight years or less, you're automatically a barrister of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. You're welcome to engage in our meetings and all of our events. And don't forget our monthly happy hours. Those are usually a lot of fun. You can meet a lot of people in the industry. I also wanted to let you know that anybody who's a law student awaiting bar results or within three years of their practice get a free membership with the Beverly Hills Bar Association. So please take advantage of that because it's a, it's a great perk for you and you can attend webinars like this ad nauseum, <laughs> however many you want. <laughs> so um, with that, I wanted to actually, I'm so excited to do this program. Judge Pfeffer and I have been trying to get this program together pre-pandemic. We actually had a program and um, because of the shutdown, we weren't be able to move forward with it. It was an in-person program. So I'm so happy that we've been working together on this program. I'm so excited for everything that she has to say. So I wanted to introduce her to you. Um, Judge Elizabeth Pfeffer has served on the Los Angeles Superior Court for 13 years presiding over more than 75 civil jury trials, more than 500 civil bench trials, hundreds of evidentiary hearings, and numerous settlement conferences. She's now a mediator, arbitrator, referee, and private judge with ADR services. And Judge Pfeffer handles a diverse range of complex cases, as you can see from her extensive resume that was included in your handouts. Um, She's, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to see you, Judge Pfeffer, and it's really nice to have you. Thank you so much for doing the program. And with that, I will give it to you. How are you really? I'm doing great, dear. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here with you. Hey, everyone's great. We're all great. <laughs> Always great, right? That's what, we, that's what we say. Right. You know, well, that's kind of the joke. Like if you say, how are you? And if someone like gives you an honest answer, like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't want to hear all that. I wanted to just like, know oh, how you are. It's my mom. My dog, you know, my dog, you know, you know, you know, so, but that's, that is important. And again, I, I'm so appreciative. We can actually do this. I know we saw each other a few weeks ago with the installation of officers at the Skirball, the Beverly, Beverly Hills bar. That was great. And kind of like the Beverly Hills bar is always kind of like a special soft spot in my heart. So I don't know many of you knew my late father-in-law, Irving Pfeffer. He was the original judge Pfeffer on the LA Spear court. But before that, he was a sole practitioner in Beverly Hills for 30 years. So no, this is like was, a legacy for you. Exactly. So he was in, I don't know, still called the Gibraltar Bank building, but the high rise at Doheny and Wilshire. And then when 8383 Wilshire opened, he was there. So I, he was Beverly Hills lawyer. So I was never a Beverly Hills lawyer, but I married the son of one. So, <laughs> but, I, but I know it always have had quality programming and attended many when I was on the bench as well. So I'm like super excited to be here. It's like your quality standards are like way up here. So, but how are you really? So um, the materials start on page 27 of the packet. And so I kind of broke it down into three sections of kind of like mental health and substance abuse in the legal profession pre-pandemic, right? The before times, and then during the pandemic, and then now. And we, you know, we're all kind of hoping like, well, hey, we'll bounce back. Um, so, you know, here we are. So kind of pre-pandemic, you'll see in the materials, you know, we all know law is stressful. We, we know that. I was that associate burning the midnight oil and law school stressful. So it's an inherently stressful profession. It's kind of like, you can like never bill enough, right? Like as a young associate, like I didn't, I didn't go on vacation, <laughs> just billing all the time, you know? So there's always someone who can bill more and work more and, it, and it's adversarial. It's called the adversarial system. And so we were even asking that in law school, like, well, are lawyers like born or made? Like, does does law school attract a certain personality type or does law school turn you into, you know, the litigator? And so I, we, we, we kind of came up with our own theories during law school, but 
yeah, no one who meets me is like, she would have made a great kindergarten teacher, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Says no one. Like, oh, she's so mellow and laid back. Like, said no one ever. So, and I think we're all like that. We're all very competitive people. But there are unique stresses. I have a very close friend who's an eye surgeon, and we walk once a week on the weekends and go for nice long walks. And then, I, okay, if she has a bad day, she operates on people's eyeballs. Like, <laughs> a bad day, that's kind of much more dramatic than like, well, gee, you know, Judge Pfeffer, you know, let in evidence that she shouldn't have, right? Or she sustained an objection that she should have overruled, right? Like her consequences for a bad day are like far more dramatic, but yet it's very stressful. And again, you, we've all had that opposing counsel is just, you know. And well, I think regardless of the consequences as attorneys, we feel like if we have a bad day, it's still just as dramatic, even though those, you know, you can't, make somebody blind but at the same right. time you're still feeling like it's this dramatic overload of oh i failed well exactly and that's the thing like if you lose a case like you know did the client lose or you lost right like well i lost the case like even though i didn't create the facts and we do take it personally and it is again we are competitive and part of it is you know you don't show any weakness right that's why some lawyers are the way they are like, well, to be kind is to be weak. So I'm just going to be that person. So all, all these stresses and it is, it is all consuming. You do have to immerse yourself in your client's issues and client's problems. And so I think we're all familiar with that. So pre-pandemic, you know, there were some studies about the law and legal profession and how it affects people. And it's in the materials. There was this major study done in 2016 by the American Bar Association with the Ford Foundation, Betty Ford Foundation. And so they, I have all the breakdowns in the materials of the survey pool, like almost 13,000 lawyers were interviewed of every different, you know, sex, race, religion, you know, is it, is it trying to be a, a pretty good cross section? It was the largest, most comprehensive study to date. And they asked people, what have you used in the last 12 months? So, you know, 84% of lawyers used alcohol in the previous 24 months, 17% uh, used uh, tobacco and then sedatives, almost 16% marijuana back then it was 10%. And now with the laws changing that, that may be a lot higher, but opioids, stimulants, cocaine, you know, there was some use. The materials define, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction when it has an adverse effect. So like, if you drink one drink, is that a problem? Like, well, for some people, any amount of alcohol is a problem, but for others, it's not. So where does it become a problem? It's like with gambling, like, can you go to Vegas and have fun and gamble? Or you just, you know, you just like, you're going to lose like your life savings because you're so wrapped up on the poker table, right? So when it becomes harmful. And so that study found that 20, 21% of licensed employed lawyers qualified as problem drinkers, 28%, again, this is 2016, had some level of depression that they struggled with and 19% experienced symptoms of anxiety. And so and it, this is kind of an interesting statistic that you and I were kind of chewing on there before today is, uh, the study found that attorneys in the first year, the first 10 years of practice had the highest incidence of these problems. So 31% in like the first 10 years, as longevity in the practice of law increases, dependency numbers go down. So we're like, there was no reason given for that. I don't know what your thoughts were on that. And as, as somebody newer in the practice, I feel like the, the longer you are in practice, the more assistance you have. So it's not, everything's not on you, like this life or death kind of feeling of I'm going to lose my job or I'm going to, if I lose this or I'm, if I don't bring enough business or, you know, you're not staying awake at night, maybe you're a little bit more secure because you have more assistance. At least that that's what I feel. I don't know what anybody else thinks. Um, like you guys feel free to put into the chat. What do you think? Yeah, Any, the, yeah. yeah the barristers on, on the program, let us know what you think. Do you think that it's because of assistance or do you think that you just get more used to the profession and used to the stress or what, what do you guys think? Feel free to put it into the Q and A and I'll, I'll bring it into the program. Right. So again, I didn't see a reason in the study. I was thinking, just kind of looking back to my early years of practice, like it, it was all consuming, like working all the time, billing all the time, you know, you have to prepare. I mean, obviously preparing for your first 10 depositions is a lot different than your, you know, your hundredth or thousandth deposition. So it's, all consuming, but at a certain point, either look, some people just don't want to be lawyers anymore, or they change their area of practice. Like maybe I really don't want to be a litigator because my dad was a litigator, or my mom was a litigator, but maybe I really, maybe my passion is in some other area of law or something altogether that's different. 
But for me, after a few years, like, okay, I can't be all consuming. So at least for me, my coping mechanism was I will work as late as I need to at the office, but when I come home, I'm home and I'm done. So whether that's 10 o'clock at night or whatever it was, weekends, if I need to work on the weekends, I'm going to the office. I'm not going to work at home. And I know many people work at home successfully, but that's kind of like how I figured out coping with the stress of litigation. I just, I had to have that physical separation and mental separation. So, but again, I'd be curious to see what others think. So, you know, you kind of figured out all, all the way. So getting back to the ABA study, just attorneys experience problematic drinking that is hazardous, harmful, or otherwise consistent with alcohol use disorders at a higher rate than other professional populations. So lawyers do, you know, have alcohol problems more than in other professions. So that was the conclusion of that study. And the materials, there's a list of signs and symptoms to look for. I won't go over all of them, but, you know, behavior changes, appearance changes, you know, they isolate, stop attending functions, mood changes, um, kind of work smelling of alcohol, and then it get, gets worse from there, like bar complaints. So this is kind of like the segue into like now the pandemic. So when we were kind of talking beforehand, at least I was on the bench, we go to bar events, I wouldn't drink any alcohol because you don't want to have some wine. And then on your way home, someone rends you, police come and like, oh yeah, I, I had a glass of wine, right? HBD in the police report. Like you don't want that. So one reason people don't drink is, you know, you have to drive home. You don't want to deal with that. You have to get up early for court the next day. You're preparing for a judge who's going to give you a hard time, whatever it is. I mean, I, I had a case in Santa Barbara years ago. I had to be in Santa Barbara courthouse at 830 in the morning, all dressed up, right? No drinking the night before. <laughs> so I'm up early, right? So versus the pandemic, like, well, you're not going in the office. People aren't noticing you. They aren't seeing you. You just kind of log on. You don't even need your video screen on. Who's to know? Who's to know if people aren't drinking right now? You, I, I don't know, right? Well, then there was the option to have alcohol delivered. Exactly. That never happened before. <laughs> right. It's like, who's to know? Now you're doing a court appearance virtually or a deposition. How do you, how do you know the guy that your opposing counsel is not drinking or, you know, the lawyer kind of staggers in the next day? How do you, you don't know, you don't see them and appearance changes. I mean, well, heck, <laughs> I didn't get my hair cut for months because my hairdresser was on a lockdown. So my parents <laughs> kind of changed during the lockdowns. Right. So who's to know? Versus being in court like every day, facing opposing counsel who wants to get the best of you every day, that kind of makes you sharper and you're not using substances as much. So these are all changes that you couldn't really notice during the pandemic. I mean, years ago, uh, for my civil assignment downtown at a family law assignment, and I remember there was a lawyer who showed up to court who appeared to be high. He was red and like super aggressive. And when that was done. Uh, I didn't know this at the time, but my opposing counsel or his opposing counsel went to my bailiff and said, Hey, he's, he's high. You know, you're on the bench, you're like way up here and you're, you know, you're down. It's hard to tell. So told my bailiff, like, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but if someone checks in and they look like there's a, there's a problem, you know, you know, check them out and whatnot. So it turned out this lawyer already had problems with the state bar. He had a DUI or some drug related issue that the state bar was already investigating and you know, like, look, you'll see it in the daily journal. Like how many lawyers get into trouble? And by the way, it's, you know, there's a DUI or many of these are symptoms of bigger problems. You know, lawyers like, you know, their marriage is busting up or they're, you know, they're, things aren't going well at home with their kids. And so people turn, that's what's called self-medication. But then it's, oh, we got the attorney client trust account there, right? Well, I kind of need money because I'm an alcoholic and I need to buy drugs and like, now I've got my clients, client trust account there. Oh, they're not going to notice, right? And that's where lawyers get into trouble. You'll see that in the Daily Journal. Lawyers don't like oftentimes just steal for the sake of stealing it because their personal life's falling apart, substance abuse. And then they turn to this pot of cash there that you're never, ever, ever supposed to touch. And then the state bar comes calling. So that's why kind of like early spotting and intervention is super important before it spirals out of control. Again, every week in the Daily Journal, you'll see these disciplinary reports. And if you had any thoughts on that, Dara? Um, well, I actually wanted to go back to the one about the younger attorneys. Some of the people in the chat responded. Um, Kimberly says that 
the difference between the more experienced attorneys is that their ability to determine their priorities that not everything is urgent and as a baby attorney everything feels so big and um absolutely correct yeah yeah i mean that's kind of my feeling too and that's how i feel maybe with the assistance that everything doesn't feel so big because you can kind of delegate and give people other smaller tasks and then you can deal with the other things but yeah it is it's that everything feels so big your career your future everything right um marie says that who as someone with roughly 40 years of experience i think part of the decrease over time is simply that we learn to cope in a variety of ways ranging from quitting changing area of practice employment finding friends to vent mindfulness therapy and other help so you would be able to speak to that a little bit more, Judge Pfeffer. Yeah, sure. And so that's why we have all these coping mechanisms and deal with it. But I also agree with the other point. I mean, again, looking back, yeah, there was a new lawyer associate wanting to make partner. And then when I made partner, like, I'm busy. I'm still a managing partner. Hire me a few more associates, right? There's only so much I could do. And so I'd get you know, like the army of associates to help me versus you're that second, third year lawyer, like, you're, you know, you're helping someone else. So the partner gives you an assignment like, well, that's gotta be done, right? Like, do you wanna make partner here? Do you want a future here? You're gonna do this and do whatever you need to do. But absolutely, the the, the coping mechanisms are important too. So- uh, um, Margaret is asking how, be, how come nobody mentions overeating in uh, when we're talking about substance abuse? It, that's an interesting question as well. Oh, absolutely. I think it's, it's you know, the alter, yeah, I mean, certainly that's a problem and there are many self-destructive behaviors you know like overeating i think a lot of the literature focuses on the abuse because you know it alters your brain and your body and and all that versus like well if i just eat a lot like it is a very unhealthy thing to do and i try not to do that <laughs> chocolate calls <laughs> and chocolate calls sometimes, I sometimes you just have to i mean <laughs> lovely creme brulee there i you know I think it's that still that it. dopamine thing, you know, happens with the food and you need well, your absolutely right. But I mean, if you just like stuff yourself on like pancakes and maple syrup, like you can still like drive to court. So, <laughs> I mean, unless you have an underlying health problem. I mean, you can show up to court and you're just like full or eat too much at lunch versus like, okay, you've knocked a few back during lunch. And I even remember as a new lawyer, I mean, you know, all these partners, they go to lunch at the whatever club downtown and knock a few back and come back after lunch. Like, yeah, they're something at lunch and that well, was i that think was the happy hours like the happy you know we have our monthly happy hours which are a lot of fun but you know sometimes it's you know you get with your friends and you know you're you're having a good time and you know you want to go from here go to another place or something like right. that you know you really have to watch it if you're driving and you right. know think about what you're doing right well and that's why the definitions of use and abuse are so important it's like look some you know people have different tolerances so you know, just because you enjoy, you know, getting together after work for drinks with friends, it certainly doesn't mean you're an alcoholic. I mean, you can certainly, you can certainly do that. And there are limits of some things and some others, but, but, you know, if it's going to be a problem and that's why, you know, the materials, like, so this ABA study prompted some questions, right? I always prompt questions, right? Have you ever felt, so CAGE, C-A-G-E, have you ever felt the need to cut down on your drinking is one. And then have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking. And again, that's why you really need to kind of like close friends, right? Because if everyone's like virtual, like, I don't know if you're drinking too much or, you know, can I be distracted at home versus someone who really knows you because they see you every day. And that's why it's important, you know, we have friends who see us all the time. But when you're by yourself, like, I don't know, if you're drinking, it's hard to know. Um, the G, have you ever felt guilty about drinking? And then this is kind of the dramatic one, the E. Have you ever felt you needed to drink first thing in the morning, an eye opener to steady your nerves to get rid of a hangover? Okay, I hope-, hope That would Lord be a more that. clear sign. I hope that people would be able to recognize. I know. Gosh, I got an 8.30 hearing from Judge Pfeffer. I got to knock one back. I hope- <laughs> That I'll hair the dog. Five anyone like that. You drove him to drink. Like, I hope not. But but so it just it's always like a self-monitoring. But again, a lot of this, unfortunately, kind of fell down the pandemic because everything is closed. We don't- see each other um so anyway so there was the aba that had a task force national task force on lawyer, lawyer well-being and i and i put a lot of the links to these websites and the materials because there's a lot of stuff and i cut and pasted a lot just so you could see what these groups did but just the aba groups i mentioned all these groups that have joined in that this isn't like a fringe thing 
like, oh, the people who drink too much use that, you know, it's, it's taking, there's a lot of notice by the ABA, by the California Lawyers Association, by the LA County Bar, and I've some of those links at the end of the materials as well, that it's, people are noticing it. And which is important because especially for mental health, I mean, there is a stigma about anxiety, depression. Oh, you're, oh, he or she's on antidepressant medication. Like, well, you know, if someone, you know, if someone's a diabetic or they have a problem with their body producing an enzyme and they take medicine, we don't look at, oh gosh, well, you have to take insulin. What's wrong with you? Like, well, you, you have to take the medicine that you need or you're taking heart medication. What's wrong with you? There's no stigma about taking heart medication. But you take, you know, or, you know well, what's wrong with you? You know, you're crazy. So like, well, no, it's to help regulate the moods. And so you can function. So there, there has been a stigma about a lot of this. So one reason I kind of brought in a lot of the materials with the links to show that people are recognizing it, that there are stresses, which can lead to substance abuse and, you know, mental health interventions, you know, it, it's super important. And what we don't want is someone who says, I have a problem, but people are going to think worse of me. That if I go and talk to a psychiatrist and see if I am a good candidate for this type of medication, are people going to think less of me? Then people may not do that. And so that's what that's why one reason we have all these programs is to talk about this. So if you need help, just like you shouldn't feel embarrassed that you need to be on insulin or heart medication. So, you know, it's it's not an embarrassment. It's something that you need to do. So again, I have a lot of the language from the ABA about the legal profession and the report, you know, identifying stakeholders, the role each of us can play and reducing the level of toxicity in our profession. And just what I said, eliminating the stigma associated with help-seeking behaviors. This is from the ABA. The ABA wants to eliminate the stigma, emphasizing that well-being is an indispensable part of a lawyer's duty of competence. And again, lawyers, members of the bar, we all owe, you know, fiduciary obligation, duty of loyalty, but also a duty of competence to our clients. And, and that's why these are called competence lectures, right? If you're impaired because you have a substance abuse problem or a mental health problem that you're not addressing, that could go to your competence. So this is why the ABA is looking at this and educating lawyers, judges, and law students on lawyer well-being and taking small incremental steps to change how laws practice and how lawyers are regulated to instill greater well-being in our profession. So if you had any thoughts about kind of like the ABA's position before the pandemic. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting, too, because like you were talking about the stigma, a part of the stigma is that if you're taking these medications that you're not competent. But the reason that you need to take the medication is so that you are. It's, it, you know, so the stigma thing is kind of interesting that it's even there when it's something that makes you be able to function more properly. Right. Well, just like, look, I mean, there, there are a lot of people on, you know, who have ADD or ADHD who are taking the medication. And I, you know, many of them will tell me like they couldn't focus and the medicine helps them focus and perform. So that's, that's the point of all of this is to help you perform and be competent and, you know, have a well-rounded life and, you know, do what you need to do versus just you're overwhelmed. Um, and then just one thing I just kind of threw in, kind of like the pre-pandemic, just the New England Journal of Medicine. Again, it's the study from 1984 isn't about law, but just kind of going into the pandemic of we're social beings that um, of men who'd survived a heart attack, those with strong connections to other people had only a quarter the risk of death within the following three years, as opposed to those who lack social connectedness. So again, you know, humans, we're a social creature. I mean, we eat together, we share food. I mean, do animals in the animal kingdom like share food? Hey, I just caught this gazelle. I don't want to share it. We, <laughs> that's what we do. And that's how we like, oh, I had dinner with him. I had lunch with her. Right? That's how we know people. You know people because we share food and communication and, and all that's important. So, so we're a social animal. And then of course we know what happened. <laughs> we all lived through it. <laughs> Everything shut down. And so hard on everybody, you know, everyone's at home again for me, it's work home and but now we're all working at home. We're all bringing, all bringing our clients' problems home, right? And your kids go off to school and now they're home and your spouse is out working and now they're home and now there's no distinction. So there's no distinction between work and home and you can't compartmentalize that. And then all the coping mechanisms, like, like you said, going to the gym, going to yoga, like going to the movies, going to Hollywood Bowl. What, you, know, you can't do any of that stuff. Now you're all home and there's no separation. And so what does that do to a, a social creature? 
uh, n nothing good. I mean, everything, you know, all the balances that we had to kind of like, we've kind of figured out how to cope with stress. Uh, that's it. Well, and quite suddenly for most people, um, well, for everyone really is all that, that social aspect of your friends being able to tell you kind of the checks and balances that comes right. along with that. Hey, you know, you think you're drinking a little too much, like none of that was available anymore. You're just at home alone and nobody knows what you're doing or has anything to say about it. I found out a lot of my friends after, after when we started opening up again, that's when they came and said, yeah, the, the first, you know, that first six months, like I was just like overboard. I was drinking way too much, but nobody said anything during that time. So you don't know what's happening with them and you're not seeing them. So you can't recognize anything. And then on the other hand, nobody's there to give you feedback on, your, on yourself and how you're living because you're just basically coping. Well, that's absolutely right. That you don't have the constant feedback of family, friends, coworkers, your regular social group. I mean, I think like every Friday, we kind of put together like a standing lunch of just, you know, me and a bunch of female judges were all the criminal courts. It's just like every Friday, if you can make it great, if you can't, you can't, but just every Friday, whoever can join. And so we would see each other every week. And again, there's no one to bounce things off of anymore. No one sees you. And so, I mean, statistically drug and alcohol use did go way up during the pandemic. I mean, that's the, it's it was very stressful and again your kids aren't doing well your parents you know, like to worry about getting sick your your parents are sick and you know it, i mean i don't need to tell everyone everyone here went through it but it's very difficult and sometimes what you do is you do go to work to separate yourself from your family life and you couldn't go to work it's very difficult and so um so it's very challenging for everyone but um again going back to the 2016 study of things to look for well now you're not looking for that anymore you know, you're not walking down the halls at your law office and seeing all the other people there and see how, you know, how are they doing? So a lot of those kind of checks were gone. But there were studies that did show an increase in substance abuse and opioid overdoses. I mentioned the Journal of Contemporary Psychotherapy. And these are things coming out like in June of 2020, just a few months after this. And also, if you think about it, think of all the support groups, like AA and other 12-step programs. I mean, so first the in-person, you know, again, we're social. So you have an AA meeting with everyone. And I know friends who went through it and they've told me, but it's not just, okay, we do this for an hour, right? And then we click the, you know, red end button and we're done. A lot of it is, okay, you have your meeting and then now you're done, but you still hang out and talk afterwards or talk in the parking lot. Think of just bar events, like the happy hour before we have the program and then you hang out afterwards. So a lot of that, the informal of just being around each other with no formal program going on was gone. So the studies were showing increases in drug and alcohol abuse like kind of right off the bat. And then uh, American Association of Medical Colleges, again, I put it in there, COVID-19 and the opioid crisis when the pandemic and epidemic collide. And again, this article was written in July of 2020, more than 20 million people in the United States have a substance use disorder. 2 million of which had an opioid use disorder. And JAMA found, you know, a big problem is the failure to deliver effective treatment for opioid use disorder. So again, this is it. You can't go to the clinic. You can't have your in-person support network of, again, how are you doing really? That conversation happens, you know, after the one hour meeting when you're hanging out and talking. So, so those are some issues. And again, same with you know lawyers and legal profession. Look, I'm getting to the age of like my friend, like vaps are going out or your knee or, you know, people don't, it's very rare someone's like 40, 50 and go, I think I'll try cocaine. Let's see what the whole fuss is about, right? But you get to the point where you, you know, your hips, your back, your knee, you're, you're in a car accident and now you have all these injuries. And so then you take opioids. And that, I mean, that's how a lot of the addiction starts is no one really like, I think I'll just try fentanyl, right? It's just, you have to take this medication because of aches and pains, car accidents, and then it just goes from there. And again, there's no one to see. I, I mean, I, I didn't like the telemedicine visits with my doctors. Like, oh, <laughs> you know, you're not taking my blood pressure. You're not checking things out. You know, so it's well, people I mean, are not the treatment. Besides that, it was the whole idea of not have, being in person. Like, I mean, not yeah. being able to meet, not being able to talk to. Th that social aspect of things after say an AA meeting or even with your doctor being able to have the blood pressure taken or you know being able to talk to your friends or your friends being able to give you feedback 
a lot of us kind of lost that while we were being isolated. Right. While we were, you know, our social life sometimes was at work. You know, I get a lot of support from, you know, our bookkeeper even. We talk often because we're at work together and, oh, this happened last night, you know, and we give each other feedback that was gone during the pandemic for those of us even who were still working. And then there was the extra stress of people who lost their jobs and then had to think about what's the future gonna look like, you know? And I mean, there was just stress all around us and let's not, you know, let's not forget that we lost a lot of people during the pandemic. Right. And there's well, that grief that you're dealing with, grief right. and no, no outlet. Oh, I know. I mean, we're kind of like, kind of constantly surrounded by death and worrying about, you know, people getting sick. And yeah, I mean, I lost my mom at that time. I mean, a lot of it was just, it was, it's kind of like everywhere you go. I mean, that's why we were all staying at home is to prevent people from getting sick and dying. Or, you know, so I mean, we all have stories of people we know who lost or got very ill. And, you know, I mean, we all have those stories. So, but again, you don't have like these other outlets, like, oh, I'm just going to go to the, you know, my kickboxing class and, you know, hit, you know, hit the heavy bag for now. Like you don't have that or your yoga class, or again, you go to the movies or, you know, whatever, everything we like to do, you know, going to the museum and looking at paintings or, you know, sometimes I get stressed, like let's go to the antique store and like goof around and look around for an hour at stuff that, <laughs> you know, well, I've been taking a walk because, you know, even taking yeah, a walk was like, yeah, a like little depressing said, and scary with nobody out. Well, no sports, no, you know, turn on the TV and watch football or baseball. I mean, everything's canceled, obviously. So, and again, we all went through that. We all know, but, but there's that. And then it's just, and even if you're doing okay, like, well, your spouse, your, your friends, your kids' friends, like, you know, I mean, I, I mean, two of my neighbors lost a parent during that time. In addition to me, and like that didn't happen. Like three of us lost a parent within like within a six month period versus like for years, you know, it was very difficult for, for many people, for everybody in one way or another. So you don't have that separation. And then again, for lawyers, now your clients' problems are your problems. And look, I know for even being a lawyer, like obviously, you know, I would try to do the best I could for my clients, but a lot of, a lot of what kind of like ended a dispute is, okay, we have our trial date, right? Or we have a motion. And this dispute that you had, whether it's a contract or personal injury or whatever it is, here's your trial date, right? So, you know, in June of 2020, that's our trial. And so this dispute that's been brewing at a partnership dispute or whatever it is, that's your trial date. And so this dispute is going to be over in June of 2020. No, wrong. No trial. Once our And that was a frustrating thing, going back to court after being shut down. All the trials were wiped. Well, when can we have our trial? October? Nope, not October. February? No. So there's that. So of course your clients are stressed. It's like, well, when is this going to be over? Like, well, we filed this motion. When's it going to be heard? Like, I don't know. And yeah. we have a question from Jeff in the chat here or in the Q&A. Um, he said that any number of lawyers are lobbying for working at home, but he finds it counterintuitive to the interactive nature of law. Um, but he thinks that many millennials particularly disagree and wants to know your thoughts. I, those are excellent points. Again, I'm kind of like old school, like, you know, I, like, it's all generational. Thinking back to when I was a new lawyer, I don't know how I could have developed my litigation skills by working from home. So a lot of it is like popping into the partner's office and, and it's that interaction and bouncing things off of them. But, I, but of course we didn't have the internet either. So we, you know, we didn't like fire up a YouTube video and how to, you know, change a tire, it's, you know. So the way we learn is different, but I personally agree on that. I went to uh, an a ABTL conference recently and there's a, you know, there's several panelists about the practice of law now. And several of them said what they're seeing at law firms kind of across the board, big to small, is that a third of the lawyers are like, let's get back to work, roll up our sleeves, we're just kind of like back to the way we were like 2019, right? Exactly that. And a third of the lawyers are like, work from home. I don't ever need to go in. And I have friends who are litigators who have been litigating, I mean, at least 10 years longer than I've been a member of the bar. The old timers, five digit bar number guys. And they're telling me like, hey, if I never have to take another deposition in person, I'm good. I, I, it's just as effective through Zoom. And then, so some people like never want to go back. And, you know, some younger lawyers may be in that category. And a third are like, no, I don't need to go in every day. You know, 
So I like the, I like the hybrid for me. I right. find that, I, well, my work is transactional, so it's a little bit different, but I find that being able to just focus completely on nothing, but there's no phone ringing at home. Usually there's, you know, there's nothing else going on, but me be able to sit down and just focus and type and get it done. And so I find that that works for me, but I also need to be in the office. There are other things that I need to do there that help my practice. So for me, I like a hybrid idea. Although, um, I don't know, maybe I, I'm not quite a millennial. Maybe some millennials can speak to what that yeah, is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, look, for me, like, when the lockdowns happen, like, okay, I have a husband and I've got like two kids in high school and we're all, oh, and a dog, right? So, you know, versus like, oh, when I was, you know, a new lawyer associate, I mean, I didn't have kids until I made partner. So like, you know, third year lawyer me, like, I wouldn't be like sharing, you know, the dining room with two kids trying to get through high school. Right. So, you know, it could be, you know, life cycle thing too, but yeah, I mean, there's certainly a lot more online, you know, familiarity and that's why they have what, yeah, the digital natives and the, right. So, you know, didn't have cell phones growing up. Right. So like, not at all. I got my first cell phone, like literally in law school. So, uh, you know, we wrote everything. We didn't take tests on a computer. So now it's taking the bar exam on computers. Like, oh no, I was in person. <laughs> so, so a lot of it is kind of like the digital native thing. Like this is more normal and look, there's certainly more efficiencies with it. I mean, you know, it's Beverly Hills bar, but you know, you don't have to drive in from Woodland Hills downtown to be downtown for a five minute court appearance. So those efficiencies are better. There are some things that technology is much better for. So, and again, the video technology is getting better too, versus kind of the disembodied voice on court call, which, you know, I'd have court call appearances where there are either two men or two women. And like, I don't know who's who, you know, so I've never met you. <laughs> also, I'll get lawyers who come up to me and say, oh, I had a case in your court. And like, well, which case? And on for me, this is just me. If they appear before me by court call, I don't know them. You know, like, I may remember the case, but versus like, okay, you've appeared before me. I, I know you, I've seen you. I have a feel for what kind of lawyer you are. If you're on the court call, like, no. So I think the video technology has made a lot of that better. So the hybrid model seems to make sense. But again, this is just me personally. I like going in. That That's how I kind of do my work is I will stay as late as I need to at the office, but when I'm home, I'm home. And that's what works for me. But I know many people have home offices and it's super successful. So any millennials want to weigh in? Yeah, I'd be curious to hear. Well, I will, I'll check the, the Q&A as you guys are typing. Right. So, and then again, in the materials, I have about the Gallup poll done at the end of 2020 about Americans' mental health, just, but that's kind of like, how are you doing, right? Oh, everyone's doing great. Everyone's doing great. And it, towards the end of 2020, Americans are saying we're not doing so great and that there were noted declines kind of across the board, like male, female, all ages, the interesting thing is the only kind of the, the only group where mental health didn't decline actually went up were people who attended a weekly religious service. Huh, again, that is interesting. Uh, you said attended. So I'm kind of interpreting that to mean like in person mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, services by Zoom. So, but again, it's a, it's a community of, of that and also the higher power and, you know, perspective and, you know, so it's kind of an interesting thing, but across the board, just, not good. So 2020, we're already noticing like things aren't going so well. So again, that's all in the materials. So the Gallup polls said bottom line, and this is more than eight months into the pandemic, Americans reports of mental health were much worse than a year earlier. Um, we were always would say our mental health was excellent and, and more so than our physical health, but the gap between the two narrowed. So, uh, so just mental health was just on the decline. And that was, again, I think I think a lot of us can corroborate that with personal experience and, and people we know. I mean, we all know people who went through just, and, and many of us did too, but the, you know, some really bad situations that again, we all saw. So, and that's why it was an interesting thing how widespread, like when there's like a horrific fire or a earthquake, or flood, you know, like these, like the hurricane in Florida or, you know, hurricane you know, Katrina, right? I mean, we, you know, you know, the paradise fire, right? Like, okay, it's terrible, but it didn't personally affect me. And like, you know, natural disasters are very local versus this is a nationwide thing. So we all, again, went through it and have stories about that. 
So two years later, how are we doing? So I don't know about you, so now I got my smartphone, right? But like every week getting emails about wellness and this and that, but wellness used to be like, said, like eating disorders. It used to be like, you know, get exercise, move, don't eat sweets and da, da, da. But now I'm getting like a lot of like health blasts about mental health, mental health. Are you taking care of yourself? Is there a substance abuse? So in 2019, when we think of like wellness, it's like diet and exercise, right? Versus now it's like, okay, there really is a focus on mental health. Like, how are you doing? Um, so I, again, I put a lot of the materials in there. It's not just healthy physical habits, but it's really a focus on mental health, which kind of goes back to the ABA study of, you know, there is a stigma. I think we all understand that, but we need to work to, you know, eliminate that. So people do get the health because there is nothing shameful. Like there's nothing shameful about getting help. You know, the tragedy is when people who don't get help suffer. So not, oh, you're getting help. That's, that makes you a, a bad or weak person. Again, a lot of law is like not showing a weakness, right? So, and exposing the other side's weaknesses. So, so again, I put in there, journal of social and personal relationships uh, from 2021, 20, so kind of like about, you know, work from home, like a third, 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 right? Third, get back to work, a third, work from home, a third hybrid. So 29% of relationships improved during COVID. 29% of relationships remained status quo and 8% were mixed. So like some got better, some got worse, some kind of the same. I don't know what accounted for the rest of the percentage, maybe marginal up or down. But, but I know some people went through, you know, I mean, horrific marital problems, horrific problems with the kids. Even now, when I actually go out to lunch with people, right? And we can actually talk as human beings, like how are your kids? And, and some people's kids are not dying so well. Um, you know, kids don't want to go out. They're not socialized. They're not, they, they're just anxious. Um, you know, I mean, just a handful of people I've talked to have told me that. And, but yeah, I've noticed that with my friend's kids too. Those are the common themes is that the kids are more anxious. They're having trouble with school. You know, kids that were great students now are having more trouble with their teachers. It, it, it seems like everybody I talk to is saying the same thing about their kids having this extra anxiety and stress about school and the future, I think. Right. And I think kind of from a law management perspective too, is that, you know, many lawyers don't have children or your children are grown or young grand, you know, but just be aware of, you know, maybe, you know, the younger lawyers may be going through that with young, you know, I don't have kids like in preschool, like, you know, but, or, you know, second graders. So, um, so just kind of be aware of that from a practice perspective. Um, my husband was supervising someone in his office and his son had a profound, I mean, horrible mental health problems and it was, it was affecting his job and it was, it was, it was tough. I mean, when your kid's like right on the edge, like, you know, is, is your child really going to, you know, commit suicide type of thing, you know, that's very hard to deal with. And so kind of from a law management perspective of, you know, you may have, again, maybe not as dramatic, but it's very serious, you know, this thing to think of are, are your associates going through these or your partners going through problems with their kids or their grandkids? And that is hard. And as much as we like to separate, you know, work from home, uh, when it's that dramatic in your family, you know, that can really affect your practice of law. So that's why kind of the human connection of just, hey, you know, what's going on with your life? And, you know, we try to be as understanding as we can versus, well, hey, that's, that's on you, you know, like, well, you know, so it's tough. So kind of the materials mentioned and, and the blur for this, you know, the World Mental Health Day and October 10, the World Health Organization, everyone's been focusing on that. So again, it's like kind of like a worldwide, everyone's taking notice. So I, I put in a lot of sites in the material from, uh, from the United Kingdom. They have like a whole mentalhealth.org UK website. And so, you know, there are observations about alcohol use, um, use of cannabis. Um, and, and I just quoted, like, that's why you'll see, I think behavior, I put the British spelling, like, you know, like direct quotes from the UK website. So again, it's just a worldwide focus, but you know, some of the things they suggested for mental health, it's, you know, get closer to nature, get out and walk, learn to understand and manage your feelings, talk kindly to ourselves, talk to someone you trust for support. And again, I think, again, in person, I think people open up more in person. That's part of it. And there's an like expression like, hey, I'm there for you. I'm there for you means I'm physically there. You don't even have to say a word. It's just, you know, when people are there with you, you're not going through it alone. 
So like, are we doing this alone or, you know, so just a physical presence is super important. You know, try to make the most of your money, get help with problem debts. I mean, we saw a lot of, you know, financial issues, obviously get more from your sleep. Okay. The sleep thing. I always, they always have like wellness things like I need to do a lot better. (laughs) I'll put that on my new year's resolution for (laughs) next year, get more sleep, but, um, you know, just be kindness, kind and try to be more patient. Um, it's just tough. You need healthy food. That's super. You know, the sleep thing is one thing that we should talk about, I think, a little bit because yeah. it can really impair your just everything, everything that you're doing, your focus, everything. And um, I noticed, and a couple of other attorneys I know who had jobs before they were attorneys that were different schedules, we went back to our night routine where, you oh, know, really? yeah, I, I did. I, I couldn't go to sleep before three in the morning for okay. like 2020 and yet and That's I'm still doing work and then I'm still getting up at you know six to deal with the east coast and things like that so um yeah it was kind of really strange and one of a couple of attorneys told me that they're still on that old schedule of you know being up late and getting up still getting up early and trying to keep up with the practice of law but also going to sleep really late because they went back to their old schedule right well and that's the thing with you know being a litigator I mean, transactional, you may have more control of your schedule of court, but your client schedule, especially mm-hmm. if international clients are kind of always on, but court's like 8.30, you know, so you just got to be there. So yeah, if you're up till three in the morning, like, well. Yeah, it was, I mean, I, I was working with New York a lot during that pandemic time. So there was a lender in New York we were dealing with. So I was having to, they were expecting me to respond at five in the morning. So sometimes I'm just like, okay, do I just stay up now? Or, you know, like, what do I do to handle this? Right. But I, I was very productive. I'll have to say that. Oh, yeah. And you kind of get your group. I remember when I was, yeah, again, you know, younger, newer lawyer, you know, tons of depositions in this one case. And co-counsel was a young associate at one of like the top firms in LA that you would have heard of that you just work like mad to make partner at. And so I remember he walks in this deposition and they're like, roughly the same age and experience level. I remember he had like a little stubble and I'm thinking like, and he's like greatly dressed, but just, I'm thinking like, well, like, you know, right now I have us a little early with no time to shave. And he's like, he's, he never went home. Like he was at the office, like all night. <laughs> <laughs> and he just went straight to the deposition. Yeah, it really did change our schedules a little bit. <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh dear. So um, that was a free pandemic. So, you know, that happens. And so um, I know like so many lawyers have talked to you like, oh, you know, Talking about partner, I mean, their young associates, like, well, whose couch did you sleep on? Like, if you need to do an all nighter at the office, like, which couch is the best one? What's closer? (laughs) I know, like, this guy's got a nice, you know, leather couch. And so, yeah, but that's that's the practice of law. Like, you're always on. But so, yeah, so that's the thing, like, sleep in. (laughs) Two hours is plenty. So, but it's not, of course. And there are more studies about that. Like you really shouldn't. See. And that's the other thing with drugs and alcohol. There's alcohol too. It disrupts your sleep. Mm-hmm. So just, I mean, for me, even though yeah, I, enjoy, I enjoy wine, but that's like actually one reason. I'm like, no, like even like one glass at dinner, like it, it just for me it affects my sleep. It's like I'm not like drunk or fall. It's like totally fine. I don't feel it, but just like it disrupts my sleep. Mm-hmm. And so that happens with some people. So sometimes sleep is kind of like the last thing we focus on but um but the materials give a lot of things like you know regular cannabis can increase the risk of anxiety or depression there's a link between using stronger cannabis and developing psychosis or schizophrenia and so of all these bullet points that from the from the uk website stimulant drugs make you feel depressed anxious paranoid cocaine can you know trigger psychosis and schizophrenia ecstasy users can experience memory problems and hallucinogenic and you know mixing so like all these substances can really they can kind of like bring out because it kind of you know can alter brain chemistry and there's you know there's a lot of studies out there so I, I put that in the materials um and same with alcohol it's a depressant can disrupt the balance of neurotransmitters in your brain affect your feelings thoughts and behavior controls inhibition and again the bar event maybe you should be careful what you say <laughs> right but you can't do since that well firm we used to have our annual Christmas parties at the Biltmore every year. I'm like, I'm not drinking any firmament because I would see the partners who would. And I wish I could unsee that, but I can't. So 
that was just my little thing. So again, if you can handle it, good. But you know, you're, you're a bit more, there's a lot to drink and, you know, and join the club. And next thing you know, like you don't notice, you just are feeling really happy and social, but like, yeah, people notice that. And um, we have a question from Steven. He okay. said, as a judge or mediator, what can you do if you saw an attorney in court, obviously with substance abuse or mental problems? Well, that's a tricky thing. So fortunately, when I saw that, you know, bailiff who would kind of intervene, but I mean, that's tricky. I think uh, the state bar has some resources. And so, uh, you know, when I was a lawyer there, you know, there are times where you call like the state bar, like has an ethics hotline. Um that you could talk to and, and, and get advice. Uh, judges have a similar resource for judges. Like, what do I do in this situation? Um, y- you know, so if you're not certain what to do, it's always good to reach out and find out what's going on. Um, there are times where judges can make referrals. I said, when this lawyer who I said appeared, who you know, appeared to me, and again, opposing counsel was like right there, thought he was high, you know, when I, Let's just say it, when I reached out to the state bar, I learned that there was already something in progress about it. So they're like, don't fill out any paperwork because we already have something on this person. So, but, um, but that could be a problem, you know, or, or so, you know, it's tricky, but the, there are resources to call or again, you talk to a partner, talk, you know, talk to someone you trust about that. But certainly if people are showing up impaired to court, I mean, the judge will probably notice that but you know what to do. So it's, so it's tricky. That's why part of it's like self-assessment. And that's why it's important to, to talk to people like, hey, do I have a problem? You know, how did I come across? Do I, you know, is your work suffering? Because again, that there's a competence issue, which is why I call it a competence program that could affect, you know, your practice of law. And it just, you know, or people as well kind of stop hiring you, you know? You were talking about self-assessment. Thomas has a comment. He says that you know, mental health problems are individual, but they affect the individual's community. And he's asking, should the individual address the problem, seek health, or should law firms actually get involved? Yeah, that's a tricky thing. I mean, look, every law firm's different. I know there are all these different policy manuals and whatnot. Some law firms are big enough that they have a separate HR or, you know, office management who, who does that. Others are just small. So if it's, you know, it all depends on the size of your practice and how it's set up, how to do that. Um, Again, there are firms that will, you know, talk to someone who seems to have a problem, but that's why kind of reaching out and having connections and, and even if, you know, it's good that people are checking on you, that you have friends. And if you say, look, if I come across a certain way or, you know, I'm going through a really bad time right now in my life. So if you see like I'm off, you know, tell me, that's why it's always helpful. If you have someone in your life who could kind of put the checks on you. Just the problem with the isolation is like no one's seeing you. Like, how do you know they're not doing well? So kind of check with the firm structure, how it's set up, you know, management. Because again, you know, ultimately practice of law is a business. I mean, you know, the law firm is not going to have an impaired lawyer work on a client's matter, ultimately. So um, Blair is asking that what we suggest for millennials who are dealing with aging and dependent parents or trying to have kids or pay off student loans, trying to buy a house or get billables in, she saying that she feels, or Blair's feeling that like the entire family asks for legal advice and help every other day because they're the professional adult that they want to lean on. It's a, I, I, I understand Blair, I understand completely. I'm sure just ju- Judge Pfeffer does too. You're in the middle of dealing with, yeah, parents, kids, yeah. siblings, other issues that you're kind of trying to balance constantly. That work-life balance seems non-existent. Right, right. Well, that's why they kind of like the sandwich generation. And look, I, I mean, I had very many colleagues on the bench who are certain age, like they're taking care of their elderly parents, like their elderly parents or a parent were like living at their home. And then their kids are, you know, millennials, college kids are still navigating life and getting a job and all that. And like, they're kind of on both ends. Like, you know, people are living longer and together and, and, you know, so I know so many judges, like they would just come to work, like that's their thing because at home, it's just so overwhelming. And that's why if there's a way to kind of get back, like everyone has to have something that whatever it is, that makes you cope. But what you don't want to do is like turn to drugs, right. And drink too much. So like, you know, like, okay, I know people, oh, a glass of wine when I get home or a cocktail and takes the edge off. 
And again, that's why going back to the beginning of the materials, what the problem is. Like, if you do that, it's not a problem. It's not a problem, you know? Um, but if we could get with other people and get outside and just kind of clear your brain, I mean, I walk every morning. And so for me, that's when I kind of shut my brain off, right? It's just like walking around, like, oh, the house is under construction. Oh, there's a hummingbird on a wire, or, you know? You know, oh, was that a raccoon? I mean, it just for me, I just need that time where I'm outside breathing fresh air and just like not think about law. That doesn't mean you don't, know, but there has to be something, you know, you read a book, you go to a movie, you know, suggestions like, but it, but it is tough. And I, like the press of family, right? You were, so my father was a sole practitioner. It's like, yeah, his parents or everyone's like, you're the lawyer in the family, right? You know, you evict this tenant for me, right? <laughs> I'm having a problem with my landlord or, you know, whatever. I, Curry. So yeah, so like my father-in-law, he knew everyone would turn to him. He's like the only lawyer in the family. So I totally get that. Um, just, you, you have to take care of yourself. You have to kind of recognize, that's like, you know, kind of where your limits are, where you're kind of approaching the limits, which is hard when you're overwhelmed with work. Like, am I stressed? Yes, but is it too much stress? Or, you know, you have to be able to, kind of step back if you can and like is this too much for me you know you have to learn to say no um if, if you can you know and yeah. my suggestion too would be to to commit to yourself as much as you commit to everybody else like you have to carve out even if it's a half an hour 15 minutes of time for yourself every day you know just to you know take a walk work out read something inspirational you know meditate on something like just Find something positive in your day that's just for you that you like. What sometimes for me is just sitting quietly with my cup of coffee. That it just it's just that moment of turning everything off in my mind and enjoying something that's right in front of me for a few minutes every day. Because well, I, I I understand your your feelings. I'm I'm in a in a situation where I am balancing a lot right now, and um and yeah. So even that. My, right. my 10 minute cup of coffee will make me happy and set the tone for my day. Yeah, whatever it is, or even just like step outside. Like when I was a uh, family law assignment, I was on the eighth floor of the courthouse, which had actually, there's like a balcony. At times like these family law hearings, like, oh my God. And like, I just like step on the balcony for like three minutes. Like, oh. <laughs> and just, um, I know we're coming to the end. In the materials I have, um, I can't recommend this enough. Man Search for Meaning. It's a very slim book, less than 200 pages by Dr. Victor, Victor Frankel written decades ago, he survived the Holocaust. And so he talks about, he was a psychiatrist and like kind of like his observations about psychiatry and human nature from the Holocaust. And basically we have to have meaning in our life. And if you're purposeless, he's like, like the guys, the people in the camps, he's like, if you have like no purpose and you no hope, like you're done, like you have to hope. And so like, that's the most important thing, like, you know, meaning and hope. And so he has some great tips. Again, it's under 200 pages, Dr. Victor Frankel, F-R-A-N-K-L. And again, you can read it, you know, in an hour and a half, two hours or so. Um, but it's it's a great book and he has great observations. But but what we could do is choose an attitude. And he said, look, when everyone takes everything away from you, you have people in, you know, concentration camps, right? Just you can choose your attitude and you can just choose to be positive and no one can take that away from you. And reading that, like, gosh, coming from him who survived that, I mean. All that he went through and he's able to still choose an attitude that's positive. Right. So it's like, you always have to keep that in mind. Like no matter what is happening to you, you can always choose your attitude. And then I have just some quotes from Natan Sharansky, who again, he was, you know, prisoner, of, you know, Soviet Jew, like imprisoned in sol solitary confinement and how he stayed sane. And he had tips that he gave at the beginning of the lockdown. I met him at an event last year and my gosh, what an inspiring person. I mean, he's like in solitary confinement in the Soviet Union. You know, and so he had tips on getting through that. So read something that inspires you. Watch a silly movie. You know, I like Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> Make something that makes you laugh, something that inspires you. Um, but you're not in it alone, not at all. So just yeah, everybody understands. We're all feeling you, and um, you know, if, if people can find hope in a concentration camp, we can find hope too. So you know, keep hope alive. That's that's going to keep you sane and happy absolutely absolutely well good so um any last thoughts we 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 love having you here so anything else that you want to 
No, I appreciate it. I know I wish we could do this in person so I could get people's feedback and answer questions, but, um, but, you know, appreciate it. The fact that everyone's, you know, watching this again, just, you know, take care of yourself the best you can, you know, reach out to a friend and, and uh, again, just hope, you know, it's all we can do. Best hope. We can. We'll leave it with hope. And so Judge Pfeffer, thank you so much for, for coming. It's been a we got to do this. With you. It's been like two and a half years in the making. I know, really. We, I mean, we. This literally has been two and a half years, and we're so. I'm so happy to have you here, and I really hope that you come back and speak to us some more and give us a little bit more Thanks. of your wisdom. Thanks.